Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm Lou D'Onofrio, and I'm a workshop leader, uh, and I have the Ali Workshop on Wellness and Aging. And I'd just like to give you a brief introduction to today's lecture. Last summer, uh, Brianne extended an invitation from Dr. Eleanor Schoenfeld and Dr. Fine Yi uh, for Ali members to participate in discussion groups on a research study that they're doing. Uh, and I was one of, I believe, 32 or 33 Ali members who attended uh, one of the discussion group sessions. I found it very interesting and informative. And I thought it tied in with the workshop that I lead. We, uh, in the workshop, talk about different lifestyle uh, choices that we can make that will help us to remain healthy and be independent as we age so that we can age in place. And so I reached out to Dr. Schoenfeld and Dr. Yi uh, earlier this year and asked if they would be willing to present an update on their research to my uh, Ali workshop. And they graciously agreed. I also thought that because it's a subject that I think many other Ali members would be interested in, I reached out to Brianne and to Liz and asked if uh, we could open this up to you know, a wider audience to all of the Ali members. And I'd like to thank Brianne and and Liz for enable us, enabling us to do that this morning. I'm not gonna read the introductions uh, for Dr. Schoenfeld and Dr. Yi because uh, in the interest of time, but uh, if you've seen them you know, on the flyer, you'll see that uh, they both have, have you know, really uh, impressive credentials. And I would like to mention that I believe we're also joined this morning by another of their colleague, colleagues, Dr. Erez Sadak, uh, and he also is a professor at Stony Brook. Uh, he's a professor in the computer science department, and he is assisting and supporting them in their research with matters of um, security and, um, and data, data security and privacy. And so if there are questions that come up in that area, he can assist them with that. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Dr. Fan Yi. He actually is teaching a class this morning, so you know, uh, he'll be presenting first. And with that, I'd just like you to join me in welcome, welcoming everybody to, to the lecture this morning. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Uh, so I'm going to do, uh, show my slides and then uh, share the screen with everyone. Uh, the first couple of slides, um, Eleanor will go through them, basically introduce the project team and also overall goal of the project. And then after that, uh, I'm gonna to go through my technical part, the sensing system, uh, the experiment results and uh, some of the uh, um, uh, lab-based evaluation that we're currently conducting on the uh, sensing systems part. So let me share the screen. So I hope everyone can see the screen now. Yes. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, as Fan said, we are a multidisciplinary group who has been working on um, a project to help with older adults age in place. Um, and it's not any more timely than right now with um, COVID and everyone being home and trying to find new ways to communicate, reach out and stay socially engaged. So we would be remiss if we didn't start by acknowledging our collaborators, um, Fan, who you've met, uh, myself, Ara Zadok, Jig Patel, who is from the School of Medicine, um, Jackie Mandros, who's the Dean of the School of Social Welfare, Pat Bruckenthal, who is um, at the School of Nursing, and then our students. And um, part of any project mm -hmm. is to get the students involved so maybe they'll take what they learned and um, go out into the world and help others. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank Ali and also self-help for their participation in our discussion groups. And so once Fawn is finished, then I will do a presentation giving you the results of the surveys that we did. 
So our project goals. The first is to develop new technologies to help older adults remain at home. We're using rigorous research methodologies to evaluate in the lab, healthcare settings, and then the community, which is why we have such a diverse population of participants. And we want to create our vision is to create a technologies based toolkit that's personalized, easy to use, privacy preserving and cost conscious. Monitor the health and detect changes in health for early intervention and create an alert system when a person's health changes, for example, a fall or, for example, here with COVID that maybe you have respiratory distress or even a temperature and incorporate additional new technologies as we identify additional needs which have been happening every day at the moment. So our first step was to build an academic community collaboration. And in addition to that, to test in the lab, which Fon will do. So over to you, Fon. Okay, thank you, Eleanor. So uh, I'll talk about this wireless sensor for non-touch respiration and heart rate measurement. Uh, I've given this talk a few times before in different occasions and the slides have, has been going on uh, constant revision and change. So uh, the motivation here is actually very clear uh, to everyone. Um, we do need long-term health data monitoring. Uh, this is important as many people have chronic conditions uh, for example, in this aging in place um, scenario, um, if you have 24 seven continuous data about critical vital signs, heart, respiration rates, body temperature, um, doesn't matter how, um, how comprehensive your data are, even if you have just one of those, but you do have 24 seven continuous data, then you run uh, analytics on that data, you would be able to uh, identify and detect many interesting um, events about that person. Some of, some of those could be um, emergencies, like somebody fall and then not moving much. So that's an emergency situation you do want to take care of very quickly. But there, there are also a lot of other cases where it's a trend it's a trend where uh, some underlying conditions is changing slowly, but because you have this 24 seven data, you're able to detect that trend and then take pre preemptive interventions beforehand, before things get really bad. Um, so vital signs is one important kind of data. The other part is uh, physical activities. For example, uh, sleeping, eating, sitting, walking, watching TV, basically any physical activities that you do at home. Um, if you can collect 24 seven data about that and analyze the pattern, find out what's normal about a person's daily activities and what's abnormal, what's deviating from that baseline. For example, if the person usually gets up at seven and then uh, have breakfast in the kitchen, do some cooking, but this day, you find that person is still sleeping in bed when it's already 10 o'clock. So even though the vital signs are fine, uh, there might be something going on. Uh, you may want to check on the person to make sure everything is still all right. And finally, uh, the third type is clinically correlated movements. For example, in Parkinson's, limb traver uh, is a um, is a very uh, critical kind of phenomena associated with Parkinson's, but in the very beginning, the uh, frequency, the amplitude of that tremor may not necessarily be so obvious for the person uh, to notice or whoever living together with them. Uh, if you have devices that can detect these tiny small movements very early on, then that can really help, okay? So the technology here is not limited to applying to aging, but also other places like child care. Uh, we all raise children and uh, if there's a fever, then we need to get up many times to check. But if there's continuous data monitoring, um, we can run analytics and get alert uh, when the body temperature raises above certain threshold. 
um, also healthy life uh, style. Uh, if you sit too long, then um, your uh, devices can uh, give an uh, alert to you that you need to get up and uh, take a walk uh, in the yard. So monitoring of vital signs, heart and the respiration rate is nothing new, right? In hospitals, there are ECG machines. These are traditional medical equipment. They are reliable, uh, accurate, but at the same time, they are big, they are bulky and expensive. You cannot expect to install these kind of machines in every home. Uh, that would be just too much. Lately, there's a lot of um, uh, wearables like this Apple Watch or a Fitbit. Uh, they integrate quite some sensors in this small form factor. And as long as you're wearing it, then uh, it can monitor your body temperature, your heart uh, continuously. There has also been some research uh, in academia about using wireless, in particular home Wi-Fi, uh, using a router. And because your uh, the human body would uh, cause certain interference with the wireless signal, then by analyzing that signal, um, you can potentially obtain the respiration rate, uh, heart rate. Okay, uh, but in reality, that method um, is shown to be quite unstable and unreliable, mainly because routers were really designed for uh, wireless communication, not for sensing, okay? So all of these um, um, methods have problems. For wearables, the problem is uh, many people may forget to wear the device or charge the device. Like myself, occasionally I forget to charge my phone, right? So, um, Imagine um, people, some people may have cognitive challenges and they have to remember to charge that watch every day. I think that's a lot of burden. Uh, and also one example, Eleanor, um, keep using a lot of time is the number one place for fall is in bathroom, but bathroom is where people take off everything, including watch. So in the place where you need monitoring the most, it's not working. So that's why we believe uh, we need some easy to use and the long-term uh, health data collection system. First, it should be passive in the sense that there should not be any explicit user effort like charging a device or put the device on your body, on your wrist. Uh, nothing on that part uh, should be imposed on a user. And second, uh, it should be privacy preserving. Uh, Anna will talk more about that later, but based on some user studies, we found uh, most people are uncomfortable with uh, visual based monitoring, like using a video camera. Nobody likes living under a camera. So um, the technology has to preserve people's need for privacy. And the third one is context aware. Uh, if you see heart rate increase, uh, that has to be considered together with the context. For example, did the person just um, uh, took a run on the treadmill or the person has been sitting uh, just all the time? In the first case, then increased heart rate is just natural after you do an exercise. Uh, but if the person has been sitting and then all of a sudden uh, there's a heart rate increase, something serious is happening, okay? So these are the ideal situation for uh, the uh, suitable um, sensing data collection technology. Okay. Um, could you pause the recording for the next couple of slides? So implementation wise, um, we're using um, a few um, different things together. Why is the skeleton based post recognition? Uh, Microsoft has this Kinect um, console. Basically, it can detect the uh, distance and the human body skeleton. From that skeleton, uh, we're able to tell, for example, this person in the middle is sitting while the other two, they're both uh, standing. Um, we also have some walking pattern based uh, identification because when you have multiple people, you have to know who's whom. 
so that you can associate the vital data with different people. Um, that part is necessary. Um, and then there's also activity recognition, which is uh, needed as well. Now for UWB signal processing, uh, we actually go through a quite complicated uh, signal processing pipeline, which I'm not going to uh, explain the details, but uh, basically once you zoom in the particular distance corresponding to the human body, then uh, we'll, we will look into uh, the periodic um, distance changes and that periodicity would be transformed into the frequency domain. Um, we use frequency-based analysis to find out which um, uh, frequencies are likely to correspond to, uh, for example, respiration rate uh, or heart rate. Okay. Now, this is our experiment setup. Uh, we have the uh, sensor. Uh, we're using the depth camera, the radio together, these two. And then after that, that's the computer uh, doing the signal processing. And in the test, uh, we have uh, a student sitting on different locations uh, marked by this uh, white tile on the ground. And these are at different distances and also angles, relative angles to the uh, sensor kit. Uh, and then um, in, I'll try to see if we can play this video on the right uh, bottom corner. So basically what I want to show you guys is um, when you see the video being played, there is a small window showing the person and then there's green text, user two RPM, that's respiration rate, 15.5. BPM, that's heart rate, 59.6. So those green tags are data from our sensor. And uh, at the same time, the person is wearing a fingertip device. It's an FDA approved device, uh, which can uh, show the heart and the respiration rate. Uh, that's the Masmo device. In the captain, you can see Masmo is showing 15 and 59. That corresponds to uh, the second and the third number in the iPad screen. Okay, I hope you can find those numbers. But basically, uh, when I play this uh, short video, uh, I hope it can work out. I don't know whether it uh, would work well, but uh, you're supposed to see the green numbers um, and the numbers on the iPad, the middle two numbers, they're very close to each other. Okay, now I'm going to play this short video. Uh, can you guys see the video? Okay, great. Okay, it's just a few seconds. You can see the green numbers keep changing uh, up and down a little bit, but in general, they're uh, pretty close to each other. Okay. Now we have done a lot of uh, experiments, uh, first for tremor detection, and we find our technology is able to detect the tremor. Uh, as you can see in the right uh, top figure, you can see a uh, couple of peaks in the blue line, which is arm tremor, and then green line, leg tremor. So those peaks corresponding to the uh, frequency detected by the radio. If you use the depth camera only, then this is not enough because the res resolution is very coarse grain. So you can see only flat curves, um, which means you don't detect those tremors. And then for respiration rate monitoring, we tried different experiments. Uh, in the four figures on the left side, you see we try different distances from 1.5 to 4.5 meters, different body orientation angles relative to the sensor from zero to 45 to 90 degrees, and also a few different, uh, mostly static uh, body pose, but with some small movements like writing, typing, or eating. We also tried on different users. Uh, basically, if you look at the y-axis, which is the error measured in BPM, the error uh, for most part is within between one to three uh, different BPM. 
uh, which we consider uh, clinically uh, good enough because the important part is the change, uh, not necessarily the absolute value. We also did measurement on the heart rate monitoring uh, on different uh, distances. Uh, there are evaluation on different body orientation. Uh, I'm not going to show all the figures, but uh, you can tell the error for most part is within uh, one to three uh, BPM, which in this case happened to be very good. Um, because there are cases where the monitoring was uh, quite reliable, but uh, there were also cases where uh, it's hard to actually achieve very accurate data. And uh, I'm sharing with you the data that we are showing here are probably among the best data we got, because um, in reality, there are many factors that can impact the accuracy, like whether there are many other people um, very close to each other, whether there are large piece um, metal objects which reflect radio uh, like a mirror reflecting lights. So all those things can interfere with the uh, reliability of the uh, sensor. Uh, we also tried uh, uh, user identification just based on the body pose, the skeleton figure, and see the accuracy uh, is uh, around 80 to 90 uh, percent, uh, depending on which uh, kind of algorithm you choose. Uh, there's also activity recognition. We tried six different uh, activities, eating, lying down, running, sitting, standing, and walking. And then the top is the so-called confusion matrix. Ideally, you won't have once on the diagonal line from left top to the right bottom and everything else being zero. That means a real activity, for example, this eating uh, is being detected as eating 100% of the time. Um, so our data is slightly less, uh, around 97 to 98, except uh, running. Uh, so this is uh, reasonably uh, good. Now, this is a very interesting figure showing you a full end-to-end -end monitoring example where uh, if you look at x-axis uh, from zero to 75 seconds, the person was sitting and then for the next 25 seconds eating and then from 100 to 150, first walking and then running a little bit. And then finally, the person stand uh, for um, around 30 seconds or so. Okay, at the bottom, those are the ground truths, what's happening. And then uh, the top one shows you the heart rate change. Um, what's interesting is uh, when you look at the trend towards the end of that sitting period, uh, there's some drop in the heart rate uh, because the user has been sitting for a while and then the heart rate starts to drop. And then once eating, there's actually a slight increase from 75 to 100 in that window. You see the increase in the heart rate. And then the next part, um, uh, between 100 and 150, uh, the data actually uh, didn't uh, implicate anything because right now our technology cannot detect the things reliably when the person is moving too much. Okay, because the movement will mess up all the distance measures. So those data basically are invalid. But once the person starts to stand again, you can see the heart rate start to gradually going down after 150. Okay, if you look at the second curve about respiration rate, you see uh, some similar trend. Um, um, increase a little bit, and then finally, when standing, decrease a little bit. Okay. So the point is, uh, even though the absolute number or measurement may not be 100% accurate, but if you look at the trend, uh, which is something uh, Anwar and Jig uh, have been constantly educating me, the trend is much more important than just a pure absolute value. So if you have a trend 
that's consistent with the ground truth, with what is exactly happening. That's the part where you can derive valuable insights and knowledge uh, about what's going on. So uh, the figure on the right side shows you the real trajectories of the two users, um, blue uh, and red corresponding to the two users, uh, how they move around, and also the triangle is the location of the sensor. Okay, so basically this shows you a um, you know, three to four minutes uh, continuous uh, monitoring example. Now, we have tested uh, the sensors in <coughs> engineering lab where we develop technology. We're working with um, a number of uh, different people for testing under different medical conditions. Uh, why is this a pulmonary and critical care exercise lab, uh, which uh, Jake is helping us to do data collection on real patients. I believe we have collected probably about 30 patients data. Uh, and there are good news and bad news. Okay, so the bad news is a lot of the times the accuracy is much worse compared to the engineering lab. Okay, reason is simple. Uh, that uh, medical lab is much more complicated in the setup. In our engineering lab, it's quite empty, okay? Besides the student, every, everywhere else is just empty, okay? You don't have much reflections at similar distance. Uh, but in that medical lab, there's a lot of clutter. Uh, there's big piece, equipment, metal objects uh, causing very strong reflection for one thing. And uh, you also have um, uh, nurses, uh, technicians who need to, uh, you know, stand next to the patient, uh, adjusting the sensors, the medical sensors and things. So uh, you get very um, similar reflection from uh, different people and their distance are all similar to each other. So that will create a lot of uh, confusion as well. Okay, so that's the bad news part. And that's why real world is always much more complicated, messy, and ugly uh, to a uh, paper that you see people publish, uh, <laughs> uh, which is reality, um, unfortunately. Um, but the good news is, um, I think um, after, uh, that uh, me and my students being frustrated that uh, things didn't seem to work out at all. Uh, Eleanor and Jake really, uh, they have eyes that can see light in darkness, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, so when they look at data, they were not looking at absolute error. They're looking at a trend. And there were uh, some cases where you can actually see clear consistent trend between our sensor data and the medical equipment data, where they sort of go in locked steps, going up, stay, and then going down. So um, basically that means in terms of detecting the change and the direction of change, the rate of change, um, there's still cases where our sensor are producing similar results as medical equipment. So um, we have been um, working and continue trying to improve the uh, sensing technology, the algorithms that we are using, um, and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to get um, you know better um, data down the road. Now there's also. Uh, plan to try this on um, other labs, like this uh, ramp lab doing uh, fine-grained uh, body pose uh, measurement, and also uh, try this uh, data on different medical conditions uh, like uh, Alzheimer's. Okay, so basically that's the current status. I think uh, I'll stop here and take some questions before I need to go back to my teaching. But um, a few things that I would really love to get input from everyone is um, uh, how can this sensor system be used at home uh, and for what kind of 
medical and health uh, condition. And also from your perspective, uh, how do you think this uh, 24 seven home capture data would be valuable for you? Or uh, if there's any other kind of data that you think would be useful for you as well. So these are all input that uh, we need and that can guide us uh, in the next phase of um, technology development of research because eventually our purpose here is really to serve uh, people, uh, serve people, you know, uh, living at home uh, that has a need for data that can help improve their life quality and the health condition in general. Okay, I'll stop here and um, um, want to hear questions and input from everyone. Thank you. Any question? I think people may need to unmute themselves. Uh, Here's a question, uh, Fawn. How would you distinguish between someone running or having a heart attack? Running versus heart attack. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, first, we don't have that capability to measure while the person is running. <laughs> uh, uh, let's say uh, in future we solve that problem, then between running and having a heart attack, I believe uh, medically, Eleanor can correct me uh, if I'm wrong, I believe medically the pattern of that heartbeat change would be very different. I assume if you're doing exercise, it's probably gradual increase and then uh, flat at some level while you continue running. But if it's heart attack, maybe there's all of a sudden uh, erratic palpitation and then uh, stop or whatever. I think Eleanor, you may. It's you more may. inconsistent rhythm for a heart attack than running. But the other thing which you have to appreciate is what we're trying to do is not a one-off measurement. In other words, not just a one-time but this would be stuff that's installed in the home. And so therefore you would have longitudinal long-term measurements. So you could see what normal heart rate is for you um, through the data. And then if there is an inconsistency in the heart rate, it could be a heart attack, it could be something else. You could get tachycardia, a rapid heartbeat from something. So there's different things that you could see, but if, if we have over time what someone's normal is, then we could see what abnormal is. Um, so the other question is, can real, can the, is there the possibility that real-time data can be relayed to a cardiologist with a monitoring warning system? So one thing you have to keep in mind that this data is not clinical as much as informative. So yes, in terms of um, working with a cardiologist, we can send the data the interpretation of the data to a cardiologist for him to use to say, well, we think that there was a change and you as the cardiologist need to do some medical evaluation. This is not meant to replace medical testing um, in any way, but to give information to the individual, their family, and the healthcare community for the times when the patient isn't in the, um, uh, what you call, in the uh, doctor's office. And that's, that's the important point because we don't have that data now. And so this is the times, three months that you, in between office visits, or sometimes six months, or even a year for some people. And this provides information that can be relayed in that interim. Um, would the sensors be installed in each room of the home, for example, would the data be shared with our primary care physician? So um, Lou, you are 
going after my presentation. Um, I will talk a little bit about that. And um, in terms of sharing it, again, I'll talk a little bit about that, but what it is, is it, it, it's up to the individual how to share the data. We want to put this into the end user, the person who's being monitored into their hands to help control who the data gets shared with and when. Um, if someone's on the floor and falls, you know, and they can't get up, that's an emergency. That's different than just usual monitoring. Um, what else? And then uh, another question, if someone already has a pacemaker, would your info be redundant or would be a good check on the accuracy of the pacemaker? Well, again, we're not talking about replacing what's already been done um, or being done medically, but it's to give added information that we don't know about. This is brand new data that we have no idea what kinds of information it could generate, but it could generate information that really helps the healthcare community take care of the patients that they're taking care of. Other questions? Okay, then. You'll have, you guys will have another opportunity to ask me questions at the end. And if there are other questions about, um, oh, there was a question. Are we working on blood pressure monitoring? Fun? Uh, yes, that's a great, great question. Uh, blood pressure is one of the most important vital signs uh, and for a lot of uh, people and health conditions. Uh, so um, basically you're asking, is there, is there a technology that can measure blood pressure without touching your body? I think that's the question. Uh, that's a more than million dollar question, I believe. <laughs> so uh, as of now, as far as I'm aware, there are people trying visual means for this blood pressure measurement, basically use a camera. And the camera will zoom in the blood vessels under your skin, and then uh, try to detect very small changes in the color, okay? And then uh, I've seen some work uh, saying that they can establish some correlation between that color change and the blood pressure. Okay, sounds like magic, but uh, I think the key thing is how you can make this really reliable, robust, and accurate enough. Uh, that's really the difficult part because technically, uh, if you just want to show feasibility, there are many different ways you can do things like the uh, home Wi-Fi router based measurement. Okay, people did a lot of work and in some cases they did produce very beautiful data. Okay, as long as you cherry pick the best part and present only the best part, uh, you will have beautiful data. But, but the problem is in the real ugly, messy real world where everyone's moving around, where you have large pieces, um, metal objects here and there, how you're going to still have that reliable and uh, accurate enough measurement continuously. <clears throat> that's the real difficult part and that's the really challenging part. So um, I, don't I don't know the answer for that question for blood pressure measurement. Uh, I'm just hoping uh, as people continue to work in this field and then maybe we would have some technology breakthrough uh, sometime. Uh, even remote measurement of blood pressure, we, we could have reliable and accurate enough uh, data. That's, that's the hope and that's why we're uh, doing the research here. Okay. Is there Thanks. any other question? No. Nope. Okay. That's it for now. Okay, uh, if not, I have to sign off first. I have a teaching which is coming in 10 minutes. Uh, thank, thank you, you everyone you. and really appreciate you being here and give us feedback and questions. Uh, we look forward to continue to work with everyone in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, fun. Thank Bye. You thank you. Bye.
All right, I will share my screen. Um, let me give me one minute. That's not what I want to do. Give me a second. Okay. Can everyone see the screen? Not yet. Uh, really? Come back. There. Too many screens up. Okay. <laughs> Now we have you guys it. can see it. Yeah. So um, I'm going to talk about the second piece of this, which was primarily how we got to the sensors that Fine is using and the kinds of data that we're collecting. So um, as Lou mentioned, last summer we had a series of um, discussion groups. We're using community-engaged research methods to learn from and collaborate with stakeholders throughout the life cycle of technology development and implementation. So unique to our research is that we've brought together academic researchers, older adults, family and professional caregivers, healthcare providers, community leaders, and residents. So using these methods, we completed five in-person discussion group sessions and survey data collection with a total of 57 community-dwelling older adults. We started with two sessions that were held in an urban New York City setting in Queens um, with 24 people, and then three sessions which were held in a suburban Long Island setting, i.e. Stony Brook, um, which included 33 people. So our discussion sessions, um, for the discussion sessions, participants provided informed consent before each session began because before the study started, we did get IRB approvals. They listened to a short presentation by my collaborators, Dr. Fan Yi and Dr. Ara Zadak from the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences, where they described our project and technology's role in monitoring health and well-being as individuals age. Then each individual completed an anonymous research survey about participants' technology use and opinions about different kinds of home installed sensors. And that's why when Lou asked, he completed the, sense of the survey. Um, I'm not supposed to say that, but he said that he um, participated in the session. So I'm not disclosing anything he didn't disclose already. Um, but these these um, surveys helped formulate our direction and then we had a discussion so today i'm going to present for you the results of the survey and from our discussions so the survey included um, topics related to demographics like age and gender social determinants of health such as education access to care and information about your neighborhood technology access and confidence of use comfort with different kinds, number and locations of sensors. So in general, when someone's home alone, when someone's sick, when someone's having a health problem requiring ongoing monitoring, and with whom and under what conditions would respondents be comfortable sharing information generated by the sensor. So first I'm gonna talk about the survey results and then I'll talk about the discussion. So 53% of participants were female. We had a very good age distribution, 35% were 60 to 69, and 19% were 80 to 90. 74% were college grads, but that differed depending on whether we were in New York City or on Long Island, and 79% still lived with a spouse. We asked about technology access and comfort. So interestingly, 83% had a smartphone, 84% were comfortable with its use, 63% had a tablet, only 48% were comfortable with its use. I think if we do this now, um, the comfort level might have gone up. 84% have a computer, but only 61% were comfortable with its use. 88% had cable. 89% used text messaging, but 72% were comfortable. Video conferencing, I think now after COVID, this will totally change. 60% had 
um, access to video conferencing. At that point, it was usually Skype. Now it's usually Zoom. But only 27% were comfortable with its use. Internet access via Wi-Fi, 86%. Um, and then using an app, only 76% were comfortable with its use. So we asked people how comfortable they would be with home installed radio sensors, the ones like Fawn showed, in general, whether someone was home alone or whether some, someone was sick or recovering from an illness. So from this, you can see overall participants were comfortable having as many sensors installed as needed independent of condition. And that is, um, if you look at the rightmost um, set of bars, 50% were most comfortable with having as many sensors installed as needed when someone was sick or recovering, as compared to a single sensor when someone was sick or recovering, which was only 12%. And then comfort level increased as the home and health conditions changed. We also asked about comfort with sharing sensor generated data, and this was the question that Lou had. So participants were more comfortable sharing data with healthcare providers and family members, independent of the health status. That's the left two bars with the black arrow underneath, and then the um, bars that say family. So 90% were comfortable on a regular basis with sharing with their um, healthcare provider, 87%, I'm not sure why it went down a little bit when someone was sick, but it was 81% overall for family, whether on a regular basis or sick or recovered. But then when the comfort level did change, when someone was sick or recovering with the other individuals, so professional caregivers, monitoring companies, friends, and even neighbors. And finally, we asked about comfort with sensor installation, where and under what condition people would be comfortable having sensors in the house. So participants were more comfortable with having a single sensor installed than multiple sensors, healthy or sick. So that's a single sensor per room. Sensors installed when sick or recovering, they were more comfortable. And participants were more comfortable with sensors installed in more private rooms, like the bedroom and bathroom when they were sick or recovering. So the left two sets of um, uh, bars is when they're healthy. The right two is when people were sick or recovering. And you can see how much larger the agreement is when people were sick or recovering. So next, I'm going to show you some of the um, things that people said during the discussions. So first, what did we learn from what the older adult challenges are? This relates to what kinds of sensors or what kinds of activities we need to look at technology to help with. So for example, recently became a widow and living alone. I have no one close by to help me. I'm getting so old, all my friends are either moving away or dying. I keep fighting with my kids. I want to stay in my home, but they're worried that I have trouble with the stairs to get to my bedroom or bathroom. My hearing is not what it used to be, cannot hear the doorbell or people on the phone. It's hard to get assistance on the phone. Everything is automated. I need to speak with a person. Don't want my kids monitoring me if they know too much and you could fill in whatever the dots are. I want to FaceTime with my kids, but since the internet broke, put that in quotes, I have no one to help me fix it. Um, and cannot cook much anymore. I can't stand too long, can't lift my arms to reach stuff and or bend down to take things out of low cabinets. Or I just got discharged from the hospital. I'm afraid to be alone, especially at night. And taking so many meds, I get confused. We also asked participants their concerns or questions about home monitoring, and that addressed one of the questions that was asked during Fon's talk. I value my privacy. I don't want people to see me. There's an added expense, I'm on a fixed income. Too complicated to use, I'm not technologically savvy. I do not want sensors in my bedroom or bathroom. I don't want my kids to see me naked. A lot of women said that. How will I share these data with my healthcare provider? Don't want to be overwhelmed by the data. How will these data help me with monitoring my health? Don't want data collected on my grandkids when they visit. Who will fix it if it breaks? 
I'm afraid of losing my independence if I am monitored at home. What data will be collected and from whom? Do I have to get permissions from visitors before they come into my home? And then I would like to turn the sensors on and off when I want to. And finally, because there are a lot of caregivers, we wanted to find out the caregiver concerns for caring for older adults. So some of the things were, my dad has so many doctor appointments, how do we balance work and going with him? My dad forgets to eat, I prepare his food, but find it still in the fridge days later. If mom doesn't call the phone, doesn't answer the phone when we call, we have to get in the car and drive an hour to make sure she's okay. That one I love because I used to live in Stony Brook and my parents were here. I'm in the house now where I grew up in. And I would call every night at nine o'clock. If the phone rang and she didn't answer, I got nervous. So I would now get in the car, drive the hour, come home at 10 o'clock. I'd walk in the house and my mother would be like, oh, it's so good to see you. And I'm like, didn't you know the phone wasn't working? So, you know, this is something that um, children go through um, all the time. We've had this with an uncle. We've had this with a father. You know, it's a big challenge. And so this is one of the impetuses for me is to try to give caregivers peace of mind too so that they know that their loved ones are okay. Um, my mom has poor balance and falls often. She's been on the floor for hours before someone came home. Wish there was a way to know my husband's okay at home when I have to run errands. Our kids live on the West Coast. What good will it do if I call them and they have a problem or they call me? I'm so tired, I don't sleep. I worry about my wife who gets up at night. She has even walked outside without shoes and a coat. And so we've heard this a number of times because of dementia, because of Alzheimer's. My dad has dementia and likes to wander. We cannot always be in the same room to keep track of him. And then I can't watch my mom 24 hours a day. My parents want to stay in their home as long as possible. We have no extra room for them to move in. So there's all of these different um, things that come up. So how has this impacted our research choices? Our survey findings and discussions inform requirements to develop a sensor system that's flexible enough to accommodate individuals in different life phases with different levels of comfort, home environments, amount of expendable income, and available support systems. We're very cognizant of expense. And although maybe um, some people can afford sensors, Right now, those that are on the market and those that are available are extremely expensive, especially if you're going to censor an entire home. So we're looking at developing sensors that are cost effective and can be deployed to multiple home environments. And then the availability, the availability of support systems. Who will be called? Who will get the information? And it also helped us focus then on low cost non-visual, non-visual, non-wearable sensors for tracking physiologic data and activities of daily living while preserving privacy. By looking at activities of daily living, we could get at things like food insecurity because someone's not going to the kitchen and eating. Maybe someone's not taking their medicines. They're not walking the way they used to. And maybe that could be because of a chronic condition or the onset of a new problem. So all these things come into play to provide information, again, as I mentioned before, in between office visits, provide information when, as they say, someone is not looking. And ongoing discussions. These raised a lot of good topics that we have kept on talking about and speaking with our stakeholders. So who can censors collect and store data from? Consenting residents, guests, minors? That was a big question with a lot of our participants. If the grandkids are at the house, they don't want that data collected. What data should be shared and with whom? Under what conditions, routine, emerging problems, emergency situations, whom should reports be shared with? Who's responsible for the review of the reports? You don't want to overwhelm the individual, their family, or their providers. And who owns the data? This is one of the biggest questions right now because of a lot of different data that's being collected from activity trackers like Fitbit and Apple Watch to Facebook, Google, 
all these different things. So who owns the data and what can the aggregate population level de-identified data be used for and by whom? So some of the prediction models you're seeing now from COVID relate to this because people are collecting cell phone data, location data, but it's helping with population health. And finally, moving forward, we're asking for your help again. With COVID-19, implementation of social distancing and the way we communicate with others had rapidly changed, which widens the potential for social isolation, the digital divide as a result of age, residential location, and economics. We're planning on conducting a series of Zoom discussions in the future to learn what technologies have helped you as you have remained at home, what technologies may be on your wish list moving forward, and what challenges you have faced while socially isolating that technology may help address. And what we're looking for in the future is really out of the box thinking, not the technologies you read about or you see on TV, but like the things that Fon's developing, new things that we can talk with our colleagues, with our students, and come up with new solutions. So as we have done with our discussion group sessions previously, we'll collaborate with the Ali leadership to invite you and your fellow Ali members to participate in these sessions once they're finalized. So from that, here's our contact information. So um, after the session is over, if you still have questions, please reach out to us. Um, if you need our contact information, we are on the Stony Brook website. So you could get to us through that as well. Um, and at that point, I will take questions. I don't, I don't see any in the chat box, but let's see. Does anybody have a question and want to raise a hand? I can call on you. Anybody wants to just raise their hand? They stupefied everyone. We wowed them. <laughs> oh, did I see a hand? Elaine? Oh, hi. <laughs> I tuned in late. So. That's okay. Yeah, well, you know, I'm interested in, I had a lot of questions, but since I missed the beginning of the presentation, uh, I had questions about as far as uh, monitoring, uh, let's say someone has intermittent atrial fibrillation and really should be on a blood thinner uh, or sleep apnea and they don't even know. If you have a monitor, that would pick that up. So we're looking at things that will help monitor heart rate on a regular basis. Everything is at the home, okay? If you're outside the home, we don't get that data. But in the home, if you're monitoring heart rate, you could see if there's an irregular heartbeat. Okay, and, and this is not for medical diagnostic purposes, but it could show trends. It could show maybe what activities you're doing when it happens or what time of day it's happening. And then that's something you can share with your uh, provider. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at, these trends. That, um, so an example that I like to use, again, going back to, I was, I'm an only child, I cared for both parents, and sometimes I went out, I came home, and my mom is like, Ma, you don't look so good, what happened? And she has no recollection of anything happening while I was out of the house. But if I know that something, so one time she had a TIA, a uh, uh, mini stroke, and it happened while I was out, but when I came home, she was still foggy. And so if you can pick up on some of that, when you call the doctor, it helps with discussions. And that's, that's really what this is about, is giving data for when you're not looking, in a sense. Giving extra information, because every time someone's not feeling well, you call the doctor, right? And they say, well, what happened? It's like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> or, or it happened in the middle of the night and they were sleeping and they fell out of bed. I don't know what happened. You just heard the thud. It's those kind of things that it gives extra information to have that difficult discussion. I hope that helps. We have another question, um, Eleanor. 
Has the yeah. current economic environment affected your grant monies? <laughs> we don't know yet. <laughs> Um, we have some grants that have been submitted. We're actually waiting any day to hear on um, the Smart and Connected Communities grant, which this helped collect data for um, our submission and our presentation. Um, we have not seen anything from the National Institutes of Health or the National Science Foundation yet. Um, we're hoping not, but <laughs> uh, we know the reality is that everything's going to be affected. When um, in the last uh, recession we had, unfortunately, I was doing grants. And right away, um, since then, NIH, 10% off the top of every grant. So you put in a budget, but that if you get funded right away, you have to take off 10%. So we will wait and see what happens. Um, if I had to predict, I would say that there will be cuts, but whether it's less grants will be funded or they do this um, percent off the top and you do less with more you do more with less excuse me <laughs> then um we'll have to wait and see but right now they've not said anything yet okay so we have john gobler who has a question john go ahead hi uh i was wondering where you, your status of where you are with this uh, i right now you're in the lab of course but how do you see this moving forward, uh, maybe like into a clinical trial, so to speak, and then final deployment? Sure. So what's happening right now is we've actually moved from Fonz Lab into some clinical sites. So we're testing it, as Fon said, in the pulmonary exercise lab. And there are other locations within the internal medicine that we're going to be um, installing the sensors and be able to collect data from patients. From there, we, our rollout and our vision is to go from there to we're very working very closely with the vets home, the Long Island State Vets Home. They're interested in having sensors installed there. And that's one way to start getting some longitudinal data on people who are residents there. And then from there, we're going to do some um, deployment in homes. But it will take a few years to get from where we are now to have a product that could be installed in homes and then eventually to be sold. Um, when Fon talks, he says five years from now to be able to roll it out as a product. But in between, we're going to be doing all these other um, escalation up to get continuous yeah. data. Have you coupled with another company to manufacture this stuff? Not yet, because it's still in development, but that's where both Fon and Eras come in. Um, they have those experiences of partnering with um, companies. And um, when we get to that point, yes, and that's how it gets to be cost effective. I was thinking maybe that the incubator uh, on Stony Brook campus might be, you know, a way to, someplace to look for help. or Sure. Or yeah. And Fun is over at Seawit. So he works with many of the um, startup companies. So, um, you know, at that point, we will definitely be talking with people. Thank you. Thank you. And we have another, uh, J.K. Min would like to speak. Uh, J.K., you need to unmute yourself. Um, Jean, my first name is Jean, and uh, John actually covered a couple of the questions that I had. But what role do you see um, our Ali members helping you with? Are you looking for more discussion groups? Um, because you seem not quite ready to be looking for volunteers to have these, this uh, as a feature in our own homes to get information. It's certainly something of an interest because we all, I'm sure many of our children have said you need to wear that life alert button now and, and they are concerned about data when we live alone or as we age with health conditions, but there's still a lot more it seems that you have to do to get it to us. What can we do to help you with this project? So initially it will be discussions, but then we're going to be like we did in the pulmonary lab. We're going to be going to this ramp lab, which is a open area in a location that's over by Tech Park, um, where people just have to walk up and down 
and um, be part of groups so we can monitor different people. So we're going to be recruiting participants to help evaluate the sensors. And so at that point, again, we will reach out and get people who are interested in helping us evaluate sensors. We also have a what's called the home of the future that's located at CWIT. It's a small apartment where we will be installing sensors and we could bring people in to just do usual activities that simulate a home. And so we talked about that as well. So there will be many opportunities in the future to help as we move forward and to give us ideas and opinions, not just in discussion, but as we get data, what kind of data makes sense to look at, how you want to see the data, maybe even evaluate what's called user experience with our apps. So we know they work with um, our target audience and that we have discussion groups, um, not only with older adults, but between older adults and providers mm -hmm. so that everyone's on the same page and getting the data that makes sense from both sides and yeah. having those discussions. I think um, at the time that we're facing a new world with COVID-19, there also is another added dimension to a project that you have ongoing because there could be many times that we sit in a situation that maybe I would have called the doctor or I, I certainly would have texted him and sent, sent him some information. And now, truthfully, I say, well, maybe it's really not that bad because I don't want to expose myself. I can't go to a hospital, you know, right. or, and, and so we have other kinds of needs to communicate yeah. with our physicians with real data and information that might be a substitute or a help instead of just going in and having some of the cardiac tests, especially you are so, yeah. afraid to leave our house for right now. You actually hit the nail on the head because um, I'm on the Health Science Center side and my department um, was instrumental in starting the telehealth program at Stony Brook. And so on my wish list is to take the data that comes from this and build it into the telehealth program. Mm -hmm. because it will then provide this kind of information that you're talking about. Because if you think about telehealth right now, it is also periodic. You take your blood pressure once a day, or you weigh yourself once a day, or your pulse ox, but you're only seeing a clinician periodically. Mm -hmm. If this data could then help generate a call, a telehealth visit because there's a question because there's a problem that is absolutely where this would be instrumental but again right. it's not for diagnostic purposes it's to help start a conversation like mm -hmm. someone's running a fever you know if uh, i know um again my dad had parkinson's so when he was older he wasn't as communicative but you could see in how he moved or his expressions that it was now time to take his temperature because you knew he had a fever. Mm -hmm. And so it was that, it's that way that if someone can't speak for themselves as well, you can monitor their temperature, you can monitor their heart rate, and then alert that a call has to be made. Um, there is a question here, what would it take for insurance companies or Medicare to cover this? That's an excellent question. <laughs> And I think it's, it will come down to this whole telehealth thing um, because the reimbursement for telehealth is rapidly changing. A month ago, you couldn't get reimbursed for home telehealth visits. And they came out, what is it, six weeks ago now? They came out with the ability to pay for telehealth visits. So now this is going to be changing. And as this changes, it opens up brand new doors. And so we might be able to get in on that change. Um, but if you look at other things like Fitbit and Apple Watch, insurance companies are now giving those out. So it's part of care, it's part of management. It might not be reimbursed, but it helps with overall health. So we'll have to wait and see. But I think that there's going to be a lot more people who are out there generating these kinds of sensors now that the need has arisen. Well, Eleanor and uh, Lou, thank you. And I want to thank Fan Yi 
um, and Erez, I know that we didn't introduce you, but I know you're behind the scenes from what Eleanor told us. <laughs> we wanna just thank you very much for uh, joining Ali and giving us this information. And if we can be of any of assistance or members, please let us know. But thank you very much for this presentation.